Hello. <clears throat> How one survived the survival after the Holocaust? How the survivors carry the pain throughout their life? And what tools they have adopted to find meaning in their lives after the terrible loss? In today's lecture, I will introduce one therapeutic method that is used to, uh, by survivors to withstand the trials that follow the Holocaust. And it is the use of art as a vehicle for creating a life story, an autobiography. The lecture discusses the importance of reconstruction of life stories in the late art of Holocaust survivors as means of giving testimony and contribution to, re to rehabilitation and creating a new consecutive identity which harmoniously integrates the past and the present. The art of Ilana Ravek and Esther Nizel Talkerinitz are exemplars. Both artists depicted their childhood Holocaust stories in series of works which were created, created relatively late in their lives, in their 60s and 70s. The distance in time between the events and the creation of the works enabled the artists to see their Holocaust experience in the perspective of a long life. In the body of the works, works one can find alongside the depiction of the Holocaust other works dealing with the artist's childhood before the war, their establishment of families afterwards, their successful resettlement in the new countries, and their acquisition of a new national identity. The perception of personal Holocaust story as part of continuum of life is anchored in the field of life story research, which is often practiced in the analysis of survivors' autobiographies and testimonies. <coughs> Ayala Yechezkel Friedler, who research uh, uh, life stories, points out that through the analysis of their life story, Holocaust survivors create a personal rebiography. This is a rereading of the past using new glasses, featuring retrospective and harmonious <coughs> positive images of the personality, which is essential for the survivor's struggle with the alteration in the post-war sense of identity caused by the trauma of the Holocaust. The decision to tell story served as an important step toward, towards actively coping with difficult memories. The recovery from the trauma never ends. However, the recollections of the trauma will not be as difficult after the passage of time if the survivors are successful in conveying the traumatic experience as just one part of their life and not as its central feature. A retrospective narrative can be formed in various ways. In this paper, I focus on two different approaches, a linear narrative and a hidden narrative. The first and more classic approach was employed by Nizel Takarinitz. She created an autobiographical linear narrative consisting of 36 fabrics describing scenes from her experiences before, during, and after the Holocaust. She was born in 1927 to a Jewish family in Manisk, a small village in Poland. When she was 12, World War II broke out. On October 1942, all the Jews of the village were reported to the local train station in order to be deported. Nizel Talkerinitz determined that she would run away. At the final moment of separation from her family, her younger sister, Mania, joined her. From that moment onward, uh, the two sisters were hiding, eventually posing as Catholic, as Catholic girls. When the war ended, Nizel Talkerinitz married a Holocaust survivor she met in a DP camp. She followed him to United States with their newborn daughter. In 1977, she began to visualize her memories in embroidered pictures. And over a period of 20 years, she created a narrative series in a naive childish style, unintentionally recreating her childish point of view. In the six opening works of this series, the artist describes her childhood before the war. 
This exposition presents an extraordinary testimony to Jewish religious family life in rural Christian environment. The first fabric is my childhood home. Here we can see the wooden house in Manish. In front of the house is the family, uh, is the artist's family. Here we see the father, her young, uh, one of her sister, the mother holding a baby, and her beloved brother, Ruven. Uh, the artist port portrays herself here in the bottom left, uh, walking up a trail, uh, carrying water buckets. And, uh, her, and here is her sister, Mania, is running towards her. And we can see that they have a similar description um, uh, and they are separate from the family, the rest of the family. And uh, that's how the artist hints at the different fate that awaits them. All through the story, this element characterizes her personal psychological identity as presenting, presenting herself as a brave and unconformist character who leads her way to a different destiny. In the two falling artworks, Swimming in the River and My Brother Woven, the artist continues to focus on depiction of the close family relationship. In the next works, the artist is focusing on Jewish holidays that were traditionally celebrated in the village before the war. And we see here uh, Rosh Hashanah and Passover. And here is Shavuot. Here she represents herself walking on high stilts with her siblings on their way to their grandparents. This self-portrayal suggests again at her different fate by depicting herself as original and bold as she marches forward with both her siblings leading the way and choosing her own path. The description of pre-war life are integral to her portrayal of their experiences during the Holocaust. <coughs> this exposition deepens the viewer identification with the protagonist. At the same time, it's a real, uh, it's a real necessity, uh, necessity of the artist as the childhood motif enables the survivor to display a private past that is free from the Holocaust and does to expose other meaningful aspects of her identity, history, and personality. Following the exposition are the Holocaust works, which open with the Nazis arrive. This group cont contains 26 works depicting different stages of her fight for survival. 10 works depict life under the Nazi occupation, such as the labor camp of the area and raids. The second stage in this Holocaust chapter is the day of separation from the family. And this traumatic event is reconstructed in four different works. In the following works, the artist depicts herself and her sister now alone, seeking refuge, hiding and posing as Catholic girls. The last subgroup in the Holocaust chapter is liberation and it includes the work The Way to Berlin, describing her joining to the Polish army in order to fight the Nazis, again implying her unique and brave character. The final works of the whole series relate to the rehabilitation of her life after the war. In these works, the focus is, in, is on her role as wife, mother, and grandmother. The psychotherapist Dina Vardi, who worked um, uh, she is the, very noted for her work with Holocaust survivors and their uh, children, observed, observed that the bearing of children was the most important attempt to give new meaning to women Holocaust survivors' shattered lives and to reunite the broken intergenerational chain in both the familial and the national historical sense. Filling these traditional female roles was the most common way to achieve the resurrection of life among women survivors. In this, works, in this work, the artist depicts her new life in America. At the center of the composition, she is picking cherries from a tree in the yard of the, her first home in Brooklyn, as her two, we can see her here, and, as, and, and here her two daughter watch her. The tree and its fruit are a symbol of the continuity of life, but the tree also symbolize, symbolizes new national roots 
Paris settlement in uh, America, the artist's view of the United States as a place where, can, where, where a dream can come true is emphasized by the word she added on the bottom of the piece. And I read from the piece, when I was a little girl, my grandmother had told me that money grew on trees in America. Booba, I said, I'm good at climbing trees. These words also reinforce the connection to the past in Poland. This is a motif of the continuum that brings the past into the present and the future, assisting the artist to reconstruct a consecutive identity. The last work in the seri series is Granddaughter. It, 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 in its center, the image of a little girl admires a large old tree. Here, she is experiencing the ultimate rehabilitation after the boundless love, the birth of the third generation. By referring to her offspring, Nizel Takarinitz indicates the regeneration of historical continuity. They symbolize the human ability to adapt and overcome. However, a close look at the piece reveals shadows behind her granddaughter coming from the trees. These shadows can be interpreted as the shadows of Nizatal Karinitz's own silhouette, who carries the shadow of the Holocaust. It implies that although she has built a new life, the memory of the past is ever present, threatening and oppressive. It symbolizes Nizatal Karinitz's awareness that her trauma will pass on to the next generations. This work is an expression of the constant tension between holding on the past and moving forward, between narratives of redemption and narrative of destruction that characterize the stories of Holocaust survivors. Ilana Rovek's artistic works provide an example of the second method of representing a life story. However, this approach is not employed intentionally by the artist. Ravek's Holocaust works constitute an isolated series. Only by looking at her body of works can one recognize the presence of a hidden life story. Ravek was born in Lvov. In June 1941, when she was six months old, the, German occupied, the Germans occupied the city. Her father was murdered in one of the early pogroms. Ravek and her mother managed to survive until the destruction of the ghetto. While being transferred from a labor camp to another location, Ravek's mother escaped, carrying her daughter on her back. Wounded by gunshot, Ravek's mother decided to pose as her daughter's Christian wet nurse and succeeded in having her admitted to a monastery. From 1943, Ravek was transferred from monastery to monastery to orphanage, surviving the war. Finally, in 1947, she was sent to Palestine and there she and her mother reunited. Since 1960 until recently, Ravek was living in Omer in the Negev, where she was practicing art. Ravek was merely a toddler during the war and does not recall the places where she was or the people who sheltered her. However, she has fragments of memories, feeling and sensation she experienced in that period. In 2004, Ravek produced a series of 10 woven works recalling tactile memories of her childhood ordeal. In the first fabric of this series, Ravek wove six large white ribbons and attached a separate three-dimensional small red ribbon. Ravek explains, and I quote the artist, As a child at the orphanage, I really wanted a hair ribbon. I went into a bathroom, I sat on the floor and tried making a ribbon out of piece of toilet paper. I remember being scolded and not getting a ribbon at the end. The red ribbon symbolizes the girl who, who felt lonely and unwanted, devoid of paternal love. It is a constant representation of dreams of lost childhood. However, a red ribbon serves in many cultures as a type of talisman. Hence, it symbolizes Ravek's survival. The dark green color of the work is a recurring motif in this series, recreating her memory of the dark green color of the orphanages she stayed in. The fabric I did not breathe is woven in dark green wool, on top of which is sewn another smaller piece of fabric of the same color. Uh, underneath the smaller piece, which can be pulled open, 
and can be seen in the picture, a three-dimensional red ribbon is hidden. That is little Ravec under the heavy fabrics. The piece creates a sense of claustrophobia and suffocation. Here, the artist was evoking another obscure memory in which fear and obedience ruled. The Israeli artist and art critic Chaim Maor suggests that this series represents the term the remembering body. Ravek's infantile consciousness, devoid of language, could not store her experiences as factual memory. However, the body remembered and the body talk, talks. In such a manner, Ravex explores her emotion in different works such as smelly and disgusting, detachment, tormentingly itchy, and more. The titles given to the fabrics are simple and straightforward, reconstructing a childish consciousness. Ravek's little girl point of view is manifested also in the shape of the pieces. They are sketchy, containing only few elements and conveying very direct messages. The proportion of the objects are distorted and imitate the child's pers perspective. Ravek stresses that this autobiographical series is one-time effort and is completely detached from a rich corpus of works which tackle issues such as the states of Israel and mostly the Negev, its landscape and its history. Ravek's Tzabar Fences is a representative example. The name of the piece bears the name of the legendary symbol of modern Israel, the Sabra. Dry Sabra fibers are woven throughout the fabric, a commemoration of the Sabra cacti fences, which were so common in Israel. However, the, work, uh, the color of this work is not green as the color of the Sabra, but brown, and its texture is dry like the desert. Bearing in mind that most of Ravek's works are inspired by the desert, the brown gold color of Tzabar can be interpreted as reflecting the, that the true Sabra, like herself, settled in the Negev. And I quote the artist, I want to be recognized as an Israeli and not as a Holocaust survivor. Ravek revealed her emotion in an interview in her Negev home more than 60 years after she came to Israel. Studying the nature of Ravek's body of works reveals that her series of Holocaust works are not detached from her Negev ones, as she claims, but they contrast with and complement each other. While her Holocaust works concern with her childhood, those of the Negev deal with her adult life. While the Holocaust work represent the over there, the Negev depict the here and now. While the Holocaust works are characterized by the green shades of her childhood in Europe, the Negev art imitating the yellow-brown shades of the desert. While the works of, of her childhood speak of detachment and separation, the Negev work speaks about belonging. Moreover, Similar to the role of the menacing shadow in Nizel Takrinit's granddaughter, so too, Ravek's desert work tells about the Holocaust past. Many of her works represent the natural phenomena of erosion and floods that characterize the Negev, implying a symbolic expression of the chaos that still controls her inner being and her fear from the unknown. Another recurring motif in Ravek's Negev works is that of biblical women, such as Agar and Lot's wife, who expresses her, her, who express her identifica identification with women of the Negev, like her and like her mother. Here, Lot's wife is represented as blonde, as blonde whose hair resembles that of the artist's mother. All of those, these women experienced life as refugees. In conclusion, Lot's wife looked back to the past and she paid a terrible price. She could not contain the pain and became a pillar of salt. A figure symbolizes Ravek's struggle to repress the past and rebuild new life as the constant looking backward is paralyzing and too painful. According to psychotherapies done by all, the interviewing of the past and the present reflects the two contradictory responsibilities that the Holocaust survivors carry. On the one hand, they feel tremendous commitment to the preservation of the past. On the other hand, they feel obligated to overcome and serve as living evidence of the failure of the Nazis to annihilate the Jewish people. 
this ambivalence designs, re, designs Ravex and Isatal Kirinitz's life stories. The stories are not stories of triumph. However, their rehabilitation, their families, their successful resettlement in their new countries, and their identity as creators are, are an integral part of the reconstruction of their survival story. Telling their story through art indicates that art is not only an important communication tool through which a person can give a public testimony, but not less important is that is it, it is a tool enabling the survivors to self-process their story, tell it to themselves over and over again, and re-narrate it as a story of rehabilitation leading to completion and meaningfulness in their life after the Holocaust. Thank you. Again, uh, we have time. Isn't that wonderful? Does anybody have questions? Yes. Uh, you didn't say anything about the technique of the work. Yeah. Okay. Uh, there's a lot to say about it. Yes. A answer. So I said the embroidery, uh, weaving. Uh, yes, of course. Uh, uh, both of the. Uh, the embroidery, the sewing, the, um, the weaving, all are feminine uh, techniques. Uh, but here I concentrated on the therapeutic, uh, on the therapeutic uh, method aspect. And I think all art is therapeutic in a... Embroidery is a therapeutic yeah, meditation and weaving for sure. Yes, and it, take, and it takes a long time and it's time to... And repeating the same thing. And yes, but uh, here I wanted to uh, focus on something else. So, yes, of course. Thank you. Um, do you think that the, the environment, the different places where these two artists worked and developed, had an influence on how they treated their memories. Being in America, where uh, immigrants were coming also before the Holocaust and after the Holocaust, and the preserving of one's memories of the past was part of adapting to the new environment. In contrast to Israel, where there was a tremendous um, expectation of build a new country, becoming a new person, forgetting the past, whether this influences also the way they presented, and not just you know, two different stories, but actually where they are as Holocaust survivors and how this influences the way they treat their memories, which is one overt the other. Um, no. No, I don't think so. I think uh, in, in these cases, both, uh, both Holocaust survivors, the American one and the Israeli one, are both proud in their new nations. So you can see in Revex's works, in, the, in their entire body of works, uh, she's really proud in her Israeli uh, identity and in Israel. And also, uh, and also, uh, Lisa Takrini. So she's she's uh, proud to be an American. I understand, but the results are very different. The results are different, maybe because of the experience. Experience. Rovek was only. She was two or three years old, and uh, and she all her all she experienced the Holocaust without parents alone. And uh, I think Nizel uh, uh, she had, uh, sh she grew up with family and she has a really safe childhood until the Nazis arrived. So maybe that's uh, where the difference are. Yeah, I, um, you presented um, interesting material from a female perspective. Yes. And I'm thinking of the difference between male artists that also deal with that same topic and that are much more um, aggressive. If I think of Boris Louis, I don't know whether he's known here. It's an, an artist from 
um, uh, Riga who immigrated to the United States and becomes uh, <coughs> almost pornographic in his way to deal with the past, or Samuel Buck who, uh, who has a mode of um, presenting, um, I would say, like factory fabricated all the same uh, elements, very styled. Um, and, and here it's really very, very female. Would, did you detect a, a, dif a different use of, of male artists and female artists in respect to their own experience during the persecution? Um, actually, no, uh, because I only um, uh, research women. Uh, but I, I can tell you that there is a, uh, a women way to approach things. Or there are several um, subjects, themes, techniques that women employed. But for the for the men, no, I have to have to, me or someone else. Uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, I was a curator of uh, several uh, exhibitions of Ilana Rabek, and I think you point a very important thing about this hidden narrative, because in all the exhibitions she show only the Negev and the landscape of Israel, and only in one exhibition she showed this uh, butterfly. And it was in the uh, home of, uh, called Amcha uh -huh. in Be'er mm -hmm. mm -hmm. So it was especially for this kind of people who came to Amcha, mm -hmm. not those who are going to exhibitions in the university, for instance. Mm -hmm. So it means even she showed it, it was hidden in this specific place of Amcha. Mm -hmm. So it's very interesting. Thank you. Yeah. No, I just like to. Um, um, I think there is something in that, but I mean, maybe not. But something to maybe think about that. Yeah, when someone's in in, in America and being very upfront about what was happening, there is an element here in Israel of the culture of hiding, hiding the the Jewishness, hiding the Holocaust, anything to do with with Europe and the diaspora and was so frowned upon by the Israeli art field in general that that maybe a subconscious choice of hers, or I don't even know if you can really, but there is something in that between being in America and being open about what you went through and being in Israel and how to say what you went through without saying what you went through. And I think that is... I think it's problematic. I mean, both are proud. I agree with that, but I think... It's I, I think it's problematic because we know... Mm -hmm. Ah, okay, sorry. Uh, I think it's um, it's problematic to claim that because I, um, it's very individual. We know that some Holocaust survivors talked and some some kept quiet. I think uh, we now speak about the myth of uh, being silent as a myth, not not as true. Some some survivors spoke all of of all of their lives in Israel or in America, and and uh, and a lot of process. Uh, um, there are many similarities in the process which the um, how we say today. Uh, Holocaust. Holocaust consciousness went both in Israel and in uh, and in America. There are a, a lot of similarities. Yeah. Another way to say is they are speaking. They're both making art about the subject. The, the choice to make it overt or the choice to hide it is the question in, in a different framework. Right. But it's quite late. Right. It's quite late in their life. It's not in their 30s, not after the war, not uh, after the... They, they uh, wait until retirement, actually, right. to do so. I think that it has more to do with the uh, idea of um, the f telling a third generation mm -hmm. that's become so fashionable. Mm -hmm. 
uh, and uh, witness reporting on video, which has become so fashionable, that people are uh, coming in again with their memories of the Holocaust when they are quite old. Yad Vashem constantly receives works of survivors who are only now starting to cope with what they went through. So I think that that's more than a matter of where they lived. Although I must admit that I, having grown up in Brooklyn, I'd love to know where she got her cherry tree. <laughs> Only cherry trees I ever saw were in the botanical garden. Uh, so uh, you might ask her where her cherry tree came from. <laughs> okay, I think we go on from here. Thank you. It was very interesting.